Hello and welcome again to our study of the book of Ephesians. You remember the last time that we were together, we were looking at Ephesians chapter 4. We were talking particularly about building up the church. And as we did, we noted several things. One of those things is that the church is built through teaching. That's very important. We've got to pay attention to the type of teaching that is being delivered in the church because that is God's means of building it up. Then we went on to notice that our goal is to stretch to be like Christ. The unfortunate truth is that too many people are trying to be like people. They're measuring themselves by the standard that other people have in their lives. And obviously that's not the way to go. Our goal is to stretch to become more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. We then went on to observe that false teachers, unfortunately, are like a, a cork on the waves. If you've ever uh, fished with a bobber uh, you know, on a very, very windy day when the waves were tossing in the water, you know what that's like. Uh, you can throw your, your line in over here and and before you know it, the cork has bobbed its way all the way over here because that's the way the wind is blowing. Oddly enough, if the storm turns in a different direction, the bobber may go back in the exact opposite direction. And that's the way some people are. Those who follow false teachers will just go whatever direction the wind is blowing. But we Christians... Instead, are remember to be to be growing through teaching, and we are to stretch to be like Christ and no one else. But then we also noted that each person in the body is to do his part. The church really does not grow up, and Christians in particular do not grow until every member of the body is doing its part in the body. Well, we've seen all of that. We're ready to go forward and look at the walk of the new man. Love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. So the Apostle Paul, beginning in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, uh, starts to talk about that growth that we talked about, transitioning away from the way that we were to the way that we ought to be, thus the walk or the life of a new man. Listen to him in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. The word futility, I think we all pretty much understand. It means an empty, aimless type of walk. And probably all of us know somebody who lives their life just that way. They don't really know where they're going. They don't really know what they're doing. Uh, that's the way the Gentiles walk. They weren't focused. They weren't centered on the Lordship of Christ. And thus, they had no real direction in their lives. But we, who are trying to grow up in Christ, live a different type of life. And that's what Paul is pointing us toward. Of course, before he gets into that, he elaborates a little bit on that aimless walk when in verse 18 he says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Hear what he says. Their understanding is darkened. And one has to wonder why that is. For some, it may have been that they hadn't heard the truth. But I fear for others, especially today, it's that they have basically closed their eyes to the truth. They like the darkness. 
they don't plan to come out of it. And I suspect that's a part of it. Furthermore, they're alienated because they're living in darkness, because they're refusing to see the light. They are enemies of or alienated from Almighty God. And what a tragedy that is. Uh, there is that comes from the fact that they are living in ignorance, that they've not learned His will, nor do they strive to live in it. And thus their heart, Paul says, is blinded. It's blinded to the truth. So verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to walk in all uncleanness with greediness. Who being past feeling, that is, that is a significant way to describe this. What happens is that when you do something that is hurtful to you, in the physical realm, for example, when you do it over and over and over again, eventually you become calloused. Uh, I remember years ago that I got a job for a brief period of time working as a dishwasher. And we would load the dishes, and they would go through this machine, and when they came out the other end, they came out at a, at a high, high temperature, 140 degrees or maybe more than that. I remember the first time I started trying to pick up the plates, I was just going to pick them up, you know, gently and carefully. They're glass, after all. They, they might break. Let me tell you, you don't pick them up gently very long. You start picking them up just as quick as you can go and stacking them up and setting them aside. Why? Because your hands are burning up. But do you know, after just a couple of weeks of doing that, your hands become toughened to the point that you can pick up things that are so hot that previously you never would have touched, but now you can do it. Well, Paul uses that imagery in Ephesians to describe what happens to the person living in sin. Initially, maybe, when they involve themselves in that sin, their conscience may bother them. They may feel a little cut. But over time, that little cut, that, that burning, that searing, results ultimately in a callousing over so that uh, they really do not any longer recognize the truth. They are thoroughly alienated from God. And that is the, the description that Paul uses. After all, they give themselves over to all kinds of lewd activities, sinful activities. They focus their minds in the wrong place. And that is what the Apostle Paul wants them to realize had been their past existence. Furthermore, uh, they, were, they were greedy uh, in, in all of this. They were hungry for the wrong things. They were grabbing for, grasping after things that were not helpful to them. Paul wants them to turn away from that life, realize that's what they did when they obeyed Jesus Christ. So in verse 20 he says, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth, is in Jesus. And that word if at the beginning of our verse 21 is really not a good translation. It would be, it would be better translated since. Since. We didn't learn Christ like the world thought of Christ. We didn't think of Him as, as the means of reaching out to, to a sensuous life and a sinful life. Instead, we learned the real Christ. We've heard what He said, and we obey the truth in Christ Jesus. So then he goes on, verse 22 of chapter 4 of Ephesians, and says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. That you put off. Whenever I read that, I, I know that it basically means to, like you would take off stinky clothing at the end of a hard day of labor, maybe out in the intense summer sun, sweaty, dirty clothes. You take those things off, you cast them aside. But, but when I think about that, I can't help but remember one time when, 
when Harry Miller helped me uh, dig up uh, my sewage line because it had broken. It was terracotta, uh, that's basically clay, and the roots of, the, of a giant oak had just crushed that terracotta so that now the roots were growing in the, the sewage line and we had to cut those out and, and put in a new sewage line. Well, I was the one down in the hole when at last we broke through to the sewage line. And boy, the words broke through are the right words, let me tell you. My two tennis shoes went straight down into, you guessed it, sewage. When I got through with that job, those tennis shoes were forever cast aside. Well, Paul says that that's what we did as Christians when we obeyed Christ. We cast off the stinking clothing that had been, that had been made stinky because of the sin in our lives. And in place of that, we are renewed in the spirit of our minds, as he describes in verse 23. The word renewed uh, describes the idea of being renovated from the inside. Our minds are transformed, and that makes us act differently on the <clears throat> outside. And that's what Paul wants us to realize that Christianity is something that begins in the heart and then is manifested in the life. He goes on in verse uh, 24 and says, And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't do very well running around, especially on hot pavement, in bare feet. And so when I took those stinky tennis shoes off and those stinky socks that I was wearing and even the stinky blue jeans that I was wearing that day, when I get all that off, I didn't run around with no clothes on. Instead, I put on something different. Paul says, we put off the smelly clothing of sin and in place of that, we put on the new man. We're changed. We're transformed, as Paul describes it in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, by the renewing of our minds, a renewing that takes place as we study the Word of God. And we live having been created. It's a, it's a beautiful idea there. God has, has made us a new, a new creature, like He created when He created in the Garden of Eden. It's really a a wonderful thought that we are created anew. And then that begins to, to affect us in multiple ways. And Paul goes immediately into that, uh, beginning in verse 25 of Ephesians chapter 4, when he says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Listen to him. He's saying that we've changed. We've, we're going from, we're going to say, the old man to the new man. And as we think about the old man, he says that the old man was involved in lying. But the new man is involved in truth. That's the message of uh, that particular verse, verse 25. Now watch him as he goes on and talks about other things beginning in verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. And so the old man was a man who was devoted to anger. But the new man exhibits self-control. And in order to exhibit that self-control, he may uh, be angry, but he keeps it under control. He keeps it under wraps. And that's the message that we have. And then he says, nor give place to the devil. And it, he's flowing out of this idea. You see, my anger can give place to devil, to the devil, or better expressed, it, we would say it gives the devil an opportunity. And what an opportunity he has. When, when I lose control because of anger, the devil can take control of my life. And Paul says, that's not the way it is. Used to be that way with the old man, 
But it's not that way with the new man. The new man exhibits self-control. Now he goes on, verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. So again, what did the old man do? He stole. What does the new man do? He gives. Boy, that's a difference. Instead of taking what does not belong to me from other people, instead of that, as I become a Christian, I take what does belong to me and I give it to people who are in need. Wow, that's a, that is a major difference in our lives. That's the life of the new man. Then he goes on, verse 29, and he says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Uh, now we've got the same idea. Under the old uh, man, I had wicked, wicked speech. In the new man, instead of wicked speech, notice that I go to an upbuilding speech. An upbuilding speech. Uh, and that is the way I ought to talk as a Christian, is talking so that others can be built up, can be encouraged. That's the transformation that takes place. And that wicked speech, Paul is really descriptive when he thinks about that speech. He says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. And that, that word corrupt could be translated rank, foul, putrid, rotten, worthless, disgusting. Have you ever, have you ever passed by uh, the lagoon that is outside of a pig farm? Let me tell you, uh, it seems to me that even if you have your, your uh, car air conditioner on recirculate, that the smell still permeates the entire air. And you just, you just cringe at the smell. Well, Paul says that when we, were, when we were worldly, our speech was like that smell. It was disgusting. It was rank. It was putrid. But now, as Christians, we try to impart grace. We're building up other people, pointing them to God. And so, he goes on to say, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now remember, the Holy Spirit is the one through whom the Word was delivered to inspired men. Jesus talked about that in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, especially 16. He talked about how that the Spirit will guide you into all truth. But it wasn't the Spirit's message by Himself. Instead, it was the message of Christ, which Christ delivered to the Spirit and the Spirit delivered to man through inspired writers. And so, He says, don't grieve the Spirit. Uh, don't, don't cause him to be hurt by what you do. Now, literally translated, this would be stop grieving the Holy Spirit by continuing to do the things that God has just prohibited, those things that, that we just talked about. We grieve the Spirit when we use the wrong language. We grieve the Spirit when we steal from other people. We grieve the Spirit, as we observed before, when we lie. We grieve the Spirit when we act in anger and don't exhibit self-control. Paul says, stop doing that. Stop doing it all the time. Make it a, a, a complete change of life. For after all, we're going to walk in the path that God has set before us. It's really a, a beautiful idea. Uh, because the Spirit is the one through whom God has given us the message of redemption. If I want to know how to be saved, or you do, we've got to turn to this book, to the Bible, that was inspired by God through the Holy Spirit.
We don't need to grieve the Spirit. Instead, we need to turn to Him to find the way to live our lives. And so Paul presses on in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31, and he says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now think about these contrasting descriptions. What was it like to live the Gentile worldly life before they were converted and became a part of Christ? Well, it was a life full of bitterness. You ever notice that about the world? They're, they're bitter about everything. They're upset. They're mad about everything. Uh, their rights have been trump, trump, trampled on by other people as they view it, and they're going to get even. They're just bitter and old or young people. Uh, they're full of wrath. That's that anger basically out of control. They're, they do have anger. They, they clamor, and the, the word clamor there is a loud quarreling. They're always arguing. Why? Because they want what they want, and not everybody wants to give it to them. And so they get into loud arguments. You can almost hear those, those uh, very rabble-rousing arguments that they get into with one another. And then evil speaking. And here, here's the thing. When we give our lives over to God, we don't talk like the world anymore. Uh, we don't talk about things that would draw us back to where we were before. We don't tell bad jokes. And I'm talking about dirty jokes. We, we, don't, uh, <clears throat> we don't use bad language because all of that tends to draw us back to where we were. We're changed people. We don't want to go there uh, at all. You know, the person that, that goes on a diet oftentimes uh, reaches a point where they start having to buy new clothing. What's the best solution to not go back where you were before? Give all the old clothing away. It doesn't fit anymore anyway. Get rid of it so that you're not tempted to live so as to fill it back up, uh, so to speak. We all struggle with that, but we certainly struggle with this idea, this thing about going back into the world because we don't control the way that we think. We've got to put all that away along with the malice, that, that uh, retribution that the world seems to demand. Everybody wants to get even, but Christians shouldn't want to get even. Christians are living for Jesus. And thus, he says, be kind to one another. Now, when you think about it, that's what we learn from Jesus anyway. Jesus taught us kindness. He taught us consideration and concern for other people. That's what he did when he came to earth. If I'm going to be like him, I've got to be kind. And then he says here, it's translated tender-hearted. And the word tender-hearted comes from a, a word in the original that literally means move to the bowels. And you might think, ooh, that, that's a terrible idea. But now wait a minute, let's think about it. The Greeks did not see the heart as the center of emotion. Instead, they saw the, the, the stomach region as the seat of the emotion. And if you think about it, maybe they had it more right than we do. Uh, because after all, uh, they uh, knew, as well as I do, that when I first saw the woman that eventually would become my wife, that I had butterflies. Where were they? They were in my stomach. Uh, they knew that when I saw my mother you know, cut her thumb when I was very, very uh, young and saw the blood coming and knew that she was going to need help, they knew that my first reaction was be just a little bit uh, sick to my stomach because of what I saw. So maybe they had it more right than we do. Uh, they said move to the bowels. That is, moved with feeling because the stomach region is the source, as it were, of our feelings. Now, if I really love somebody, I can't bear to see them hurt. If I really have compassion for them, if I'm really tender-hearted toward them, that when they hurt, I hurt. I feel it along with them. And then at last he says, forgiving one another. You know, you really can't 
feel with other people if you cannot see the need to forgive them. And that's the real tragedy that we sometimes face. Jesus understood the power and the importance of forgiveness. And so even hanging on the cross in front of the very people who caused him to be put there, you know, they cried out, his blood be on us and on our children. They wanted him crucified. But what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus felt with them. He knew the tragedy of the sin that they were in. We need to recognize that as well. We need to be a forgiving people. So this wonderful walk of the new man is a, a totally transformed walk as we have already seen. Now watch as Paul continues on into chapter 5 and says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. If you really want to be like God, what do you need to do? You need to be kind, because God is. You need to be tenderhearted or to feel with people, because God does. You need to be forgiving, because thank God our Father in heaven is forgiving. We need to imitate Him in all of these things. So verse 2, Paul goes on to say, And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now he's drawing it all together. He's helping us to realize what we began with uh, talking about. As we, as we were in the early part of chapter 4, we saw that we should be taught by Christ. We should be strengthened and growing up in Christ with every member of the body providing what they can to promote the growth of the church. This is achieved by changing from the old man of sin who is involved in anger and, and thievery and, and hateful words and dirty stories, all of those things. And in place of that, we live a, a control, a self-controlled life, a loving life, a forgiving life, a life that feels with the other person. We do it because God shows us the way. He shows us the way through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if we just think about Jesus on the cross and what He went through, then all of a sudden our desire to get even ought to be diminished. Because look what He went through for me. If He'd have been determined to get even, I'd still be lost. And unfortunately, so would you. Let's all strive to walk like a new man. He hideth my life in the depths of His love And covers me there with His hand And covers me there with His hand